Okay. Let me share my screen. So before the break, we left off um, talking about the horror of having primer dimers in your libraries. So that's an absolute no-no. We do not want to see that. Um, if we do see this, if we do see adapter dimers in our libraries, a couple of things we could do. We could take our libraries and put it through another size filtering step. So to exclude anything that'll be um, less than around 175, 200 base pairs to make sure we remove those adapter dimers. Um, however, every time you do a filtering step, you are gonna lose some of your sample. So there's only so many times you could give that a try. Um, if the adapter dimer is really bad, um, our wet lab team will just start over again with that sample for library prep. So you can try to do a, a subsequent filtering, um, but if you still see that, that adapter dimer there, you, you should probably start from scratch. Um, any other questions about library preparation or library QC before we move on? I have one question, Amanda. Sure. It's uh, so the sequencing then the ends never overlap. You never get reads on the overlaps. I guess back in the day you used to sequence both strands all the way when you cloned a gene. But I guess with this, it's just you can't the the technology isn't there to map to the reference genome. Um so I do like to have a little bit of overlap. Um you do great. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so that's why I said if you are back to my library oh, too much yeah so if you have your insert here mm -hmm. I mean, let's say you're doing um so, so this is why i say if you're doing paired end 150 yeah, paired end. right means that you would want roughly uh, that's why i say a 250 to 300 that's why okay because i do like to have a little bit um of overlap most because i'm yeah. mapping back down your forward and your verse reads um you'll get a little more confident uh knowing where your fragment came from if you have that overlap towards the the end of your first read and at the start of your reverse read you don't mm -hmm. have to have that um some people will even go ahead and have a gap um what you really don't want to see what we do tend to see often, and I do see your questions in the chat, so I'll get to those in a sec, um, is if you cut your inserts too small, right? Mm -hmm. so, so what actually, one of the things that I've noticed at, at Gene Lab that we did initially is I noticed that our wet lab team was digesting too much. And how I noticed that is that when I went and looked at the forward and reverse uh, sequences of an insert, it was entirely overlapped, which means that the insert, the region of interest was only about 150 base pairs or less. Um, and so when you sequenced in your forward direction, um, you had the same exact sequence as when you sequenced in your reverse direction. So you didn't add any additional information by sequencing in both directions when you do that. Yeah. And so if you're going to yeah. do here then, yeah, it's nice to have some overlap, but you don't want like total overlap because then it's kind of like a waste. You could have a bigger insert and be more confident when you map that back. Um, yeah, so, so you get, so each of them is aligned separately, basically, is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think all reads are aligned yeah, and you tell the alignment tool that it's paired. Yeah. So it knows yeah. that those reads go together. So where they yeah. fit, it'll tell you what that insert should be. So what that full segment based on your forward and reverse reads, what that full segment is. Um, the other thing is if you go too small here, uh, let's say that you're sequencing paired end 150, but your insert's only 100 base pairs. Um, what you're gonna do is when you sequence 150 base pairs in this direction, you're actually gonna sequence 50 base pairs into your mm -hmm. adapter. adapter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll uh, see that when we look at our quality. Um, of our, of our libraries. Uh, Joel asks, what type of filtering? Yeah, size exclusion um, is, is the type of filtering. We don't get fancy like HPLC or nothing like that. Um, so just a size exclusion, uh, a little. <laughs> so the craziest thing when I was a, a graduate student, um, one of the postdocs that was in a not as well funded lab, he would do a filtering of gels to extract DNA and remove the polyacrylamide by taking a kim of two tubes, a small microcentrifuge tube and a larger microcentrifuge tube, 
poke a hole in the small centrifuge tube and shove a Kim wipe in there and then put like his gel that contained the DNA in there and just centrifuge it into that. So it's not quite as rugged as that, but it's one of those pre-bought um, filters that has pores that are roughly the size that we want to do the exclusion. So imagine that it work. Are we paying for things we don't need? Yeah, all the time. It's crazy how much money is wasted on laboratory stuff when we could be doing it. Yeah, it was crazy. I was like, that can't possibly work. <laughs> and then he ran, the, and then he showed me after doing the extraction and running the gel again, um, just to prove to okay. Yeah, people pack, test your pipettes with beads and other apparatus and did a lot of purification back in the day. And then it became companies that sold yeah. these things in plastic and people don't know the science behind them. Exactly. Yeah. So it's pretty crazy. Some of the nifty things you can do when you're in, when you're in a poor lab, the creativity really comes out. Um, doesn't it? Yeah. So, so Susie, there doesn't need to be, um, there doesn't need to be overlap for alignment because again, both um, the forward and the reverse reads are going to be aligned separately. And we're going to tell our alignment program that it's paired end. And because both that forward and that um, reverse read is going to have uh, the same I have the sample on it. So they'll, they'll come together, right? They'll have the same base name in their file and they'll have the same information on the read header. And so the forward and the reverse read, probably more commonly because you can change file names, but the forward and the reverse read on the read header, which we're gonna get into, is gonna be identical. So the alignment tool will know that those two reads go together. And so it'll be able to tell, even if there's separation between your forward and your reverse read, it'll know that those forward and reverse reads were sequencing the same fragment because of the information in the read header that tells the program that it is. So yeah, it doesn't have to be uh, overlap. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Used to use filter pipettes, yeah. Still use, filter pipettes is commonly used for RNA to keep things clean. Oh, you do hand pack the SB columns and tips? Yeah, I do those. I used to do that and autoclave it. Uh, when I was an undergrad, our autoclave broke. <laughs> so my PI's wife let us borrow her pressure cooker. And we used a pressure cooker to sterilize our tips. Good times. There are labs in the developing world who would benefit from more of these um, things that work. I mean, you get better resolution with the fancy equipment, but the principles can still be there. Right. Um, anyway, I don't want to get into that. Yeah, it's true. Scientists can get really creative uh, when they need to. Any other questions about library prep or library QC? Before I move on. Depends on other tips, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good point, Joel. Okay. If there's no other questions about library prep or library QC, we are going to move on to sequencing. Um, if you guys do want more information, I do have links again uh, at the bottom of slides for where I got images from and things like that. So if you want more information, um, that information is, is available on the slide. So now um, that we have gorgeous libraries that have no adapter dimers, um, we are ready to sequence them. And so um, the first part of the sequencing on a flow cell is we need to get our sequences of interest attached to the flow cell. So as I mentioned, those P5 and P7 regions of your adapters that you added on to your sequences of interest are going to be complementary to oligos that are covalently linked to the flow cell. Um, covalent bonds, as is, is, you guys know, especially chemistry folks, are incredibly strong. They're not going to break. Um, and so when this is, when this is uh, bonded, of course, through, through hydrogen bonding of the complementary base pairs to the oligo on the flow cell, obviously that hydrogen bond is not very strong. And so the first step that is done is a copy is made. So polymerase is added. This isn't sequencing right now. We're just getting our sequences attached to the flow cell. And so we introduce our libraries to the flow cell. Of course, we denature them so that we, they're, they're single stranded. And then those complements to that P5 and P7 depicted here as uh, pink and orange will hybridize to their complementary oligo on the flow cell. And then a polymerase is added along with nucleotide triphosphates and a copy is made 
So that way the copy now is going to be covalently linked to the flow cell. And then once that copy is made, we no longer need um, the template library that we had added because we already made a copy of it that's now covalently linked. So that's going to be washed away. And then after that is washed away, these uh, fragments of interest here that now have a covalent linkage to the flow cell, um, they're going to fold over because, you know, these things are kind of like flapping around here and they like to find bait pairs to latch on to. Uh, DNA does not like to be single stranded, so it's always going to try to be double stranded. And so it'll eventually fold over. Um, actually, it happened really quickly, so it's eventually it'll fold over and it'll uh, hybridize to its P5 or P7, whichever one it went to first. So let's pretend here that pink is P7 and orange is P5. So in this case, the P7 is the one that's covalently linked. And so the P5 is kind of floating here. It'll eventually find its way and fold over and covalently bond to a P5 oligo, oh, covalently, sorry, a hydrogen bond to a P5 oligo here, forming a bridge. And then polymerase is added again. And so now it's going to copy from, in this case, P5. Our orange side is going to make a copy of that insert um, or a sequence of interest. And then it's going to fold over again, and it's going to make another copy and fold over again, and it's going to make another copy. And that's where we get the bridge amplification. And so this is going to continue to fold over and make copies. And now each one of those copies are covalently linked to the flow cell. And then eventually we're going to have an entire lawn of our short sequences latched on to our flow cell. Um, this is what it looks like from the Illumina kit. So this is the same thing. Uh, again, here we have, let's, let's say blue is P7. So we have our blue P7 and our purple P5 ends. And then this in green is our sequence of interest. And so once it's covalently linked to the flow cell, it's going to fold over. And that's going to happen uh, tens of thousands of times for each of our inserts, creating these uh, regions that have several thousands of copies of that same sequence of interest. So these are considered clusters. And so we have a cluster here, and these are all going to be the same copies of the same insert. Then we have clusters over here that are all going to be copies of the same insert, clusters over here, and clusters over here. So that at the end of this bridge amplification step, we have all of these clusters, each um, representing one of our inserts from our samples of interest. And so now we are ready to sequence. Uh, any question though before we get into it about cluster amplification? Okay, we are going to watch the Lumina video, um, which you guys may have seen before that I love. That'll that'll really bring this together as well. So now that we have these little clusters, we want to sequence them. Do you know why we want to make all of these little clusters? I guess I should ask. So why do we want to make a ton of copy of this same strand that we're going to sequence? You guys can unmute your mic or put your answers in the chat. Any guesses? Yeah, yeah, to detect. Yeah, a lot of starting material. Yes, all of those are right. Yes, the fluorescence, exactly. So we want to make these signals um, of these incorporated base pairs as strong as possible, right? So the more copies we have, the stronger that signal will come from that cluster. So we'll be more confident. The other thing is that pyro sequencing is actually inherently fairly error prone. And so when you have tens of thousands of copies, if in this copy it incorporates a C, for instance, when it should have incorporated a T, we're going to have a signal that's a different color than what it should be. But because there's so many copies, the correct signal is going to overpower uh, any, um, any mismatches. And so um, we'll be able to be more confident in the base calls that are being made when we have all those copies, yeah. So now we do our sequencing. Um, so there are different, it goes through and does the sequencing depending on if you're paired in or single end. So the clusters are individual, yeah, the clusters are individual uh, target sequences, Joel, yeah. Um, so now when we're doing our first sequence, what happens within the flow cell is the primer is added, the primer that's on the, um, in this case, P7 is over here in green, right? Because remember, it had the index in the example that we're using for Illumina. So this is our P5 here. 
So read one is going to be primed on the P5 side. Oh, I should say before this happens, right? Because here we have, um, or here I should say, we would have clusters in both directions, right? So you have forward and reverse ones. So the first thing we do is we sequence the forward ones. So these are cleaved actually um, right here at the start of the oligo before we sequence the forward read. So that way when we're sequencing the forward read, we know we're only sequencing the forward read and not the reverse read, which is gonna be the, the forward read complement because of that bridge amplification. So we get rid of all these reverse reads and we just sequence the forward read first. So for the sake of completeness, could you go back to that slide? What makes the strands separate? Um, They're here in a bridge. So what is happening in that cell that makes them separate? What is the chemistry or what is happening there? Heat. Right. So it's just heat denatration. They never put that in the slide. It's like suddenly they're apart. <laughs> it's interesting. You know, it's like, you know, there's a lot happening here and they always leave that component yeah. out. Yeah, they do. I don't always know do why. That. It's yeah. just another, it's like thermal cycling, but on these really cool right. substrates. Yeah, that's why it's so cool because it like kind of takes advantage of all yeah. the technologies that came before it and really yeah, is just, yeah. it's gorgeous, elegant chemistry. Um, really brilliant. There's a reason Illumina won this game. Um, yeah, so, so heat is applied here to denature, um, right, those hydrogen bonds between the base pairs of the complement, releasing those bridges um, to be these kind of refloating strands that again are covalently linked because of that P5, P7 oligo being covalently linked. And then we have the reverse strands are cleaved so that just the forward strands are going to be sequenced first. And so we, when we sequence um, the forward strands, what we're going to do here is we're going to use, do you remember in the uh, adapters, they have that priming region. And so we're going to, uh, a primer is going to be introduced as complementary to the priming region that we added to our sequence of interest. And that is going to prime here to bring the polymerase on. And then for simplicity's sake, um, this isn't true, we'll get into it later, but for simplicity's sake, let's say that this is a sequencer where all four nucleotides are introduced and each one of them have a unique color fluorophore attached to them. And so what's gonna happen is all those nucleotides are introduced. We have our, our primed area up here on the three prime end of our insert, right? Because we always sequence in five prime to three prime direction. And we have our four nucleotides, each with their own color label. And so we're gonna go on and for each cycle, it's gonna incorporate a base pair. There's gonna bring in the quenching or uh, fluorophore is gonna be released. It's gonna take a picture. We're gonna quench that. We're gonna move on and um, do the next sequence or next cycle um, to sequence the next base pair in the strand. And so that's gonna continue on for as many cycles as you program your instrument to sequence for. And again, that's gonna dictate the read length. So if we do paired N150, this forward read, this is gonna go through and do 50 cycles or 150 cycles, excuse me. So we're gonna get 150 base pairs in our read one. Once we have our read one, we next, um, no, <laughs> I guess I could have explained it with pictures here. Yeah, so this is incorporating um, the nucleotides that have the fluorophore. They also have a quencher on them, so that way only one base pair can be incorporated at a time. And so um, a signal will be given off. We'll take a picture. We'll know that T was incorporated here. This um, will be, this blocker will be removed. For the with the introduction of new um, enzymes to do that. And then the next base pair would be allowed to go on. Again, it has a blocker, so only one is incorporated at a time. And then we take a snapshot of the flow cell to see what color is being incorporated after each cycle um, for every single one of the clusters. And so that carries on for the entire length of the first strand. And what it ultimately looks like is images like this, right? And we have each color associated with a different um, base pair. So now we can tell in each cycle of our 150 uh, cycle length, which base pair exists there for each one of our clusters or each one of our sequences of interest. So for paired end sequencing, after this first read is sequenced, the forward strand reagents are completely washed away. And then, this is wrong. So, and then before sequencing of the reverse read, um, actually what happens is a sequencing of the index. So the P7 index is then sequenced. So this is washed away, right? We have our sequence for read one. And then when we program our sequencing instrument, we tell the sequencer how many base pairs our index is. And so what happens is the index 
directly follows this blue area here, right? It directly follows this priming region. So then after read one, which is our sequence of interest in the forward direction, then we add primers that will uh, latch onto here and we sequence our index, our P7 index. And so we'll have our read one as our forward read and then we'll have uh, an index read and we'll tell the instrument that it is an index read and how long to sequence. And then those reagents will get washed again and then we will um, do the clonal amplification will happen again, right? Because remember, in order to just sequence our forward read, we had to cleave away our reverse read. So now after we've sequenced our forward read and after we've sequenced our P7 um, index, then um, the forward read will get cleaved, or then we'll undergo bridge amplification, sorry, to make that reverse copy again. And then we'll cleave off the forward read, just leaving the reverse read. And now we go through and we sequence the reverse read. And so you see here, this is depicted right now, we see that that P5 is the one that's covalently linked to the flow cell. And then we put in our priming read for our P7 and then sequence in the, the reverse direction. And so that would make up our, our reverse read. And then after, actually, I lied to you guys again. Before our reverse read, we actually sequence the other index if it's dual index. This is single index. So you have your forward read, then you have your P7 index read, and then you would have your reverse read. If you have dual indices, it would be your forward read, then your P7 index read, and then what would happen is before your reverse read, your P5 um, index will be read, and then you'll have your reverse read. And so basically you have a set of two index read for dual index, one index read for single index, and then if it's paired in, you'll have your forward read and your reverse read at the end of the day. Any questions about that? We're, we are going to watch a video and hopefully it'll be a little clearer with the video. Um, but any questions about that? In what position is the fluorescent detector? Is it in front of the five prime region, closed cell region? Um, a pretty, it's a camera that's just capturing um, the entire flow cell. So we're going to see what that looks like in the video. So it's actually capturing the entire flow cell. Um, but the flow cell region, so we know um, it would be to the right of that image. I, I kind of think of it as like on top. I'm not exactly sure. Does anyone know? I think of the camera as being like on top of the flow cell, right? So if this flow cell. Yeah, that flow here, cell is vertical, right? Yeah. So, so that's why it would be on the right side of that picture. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it takes oh. pictures. So Amanda, are restriction enzymes being used here to cut and determine which strand is going to be sequenced? No. Um, so not restriction enzymes. There are um, enzymes that are brought in to like prevent that phosphodiester linkage. So like right when a fluorophore or when a labeled base pair is introduced, it has a, um, a blocker here, so that way that, that um, phosphodiester linkage that happens between base pairs on the same strand can't happen, so that way you're only incorporating one at a time. And then um, a reagent comes in that removes that block to allow the next base pair to be added, but we're not, like, cutting anything. No, but if you go to the previous slide, you do one strand first. So how do you make sure there's only one yeah. of the seats? Sorry, you only yeah. one attached. Yeah, you are <laughs> you are completely right. I'm terribly sorry. Yeah, here. we're moving. You it. have to cut here yeah. at the base. Right. So you make the pair, you cut with the enzyme, and yeah. then you repeat the whole process, and you cut yeah. the second time with the other enzyme. Correct. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, we do oh. have a restriction enzyme here that's going to recognize oh. that sequence on the oligo to cut and remove the reverse Love it. when we do the forward, and then after we sequence the forward and the P7 index then this bridge amplification process happens again. And then we uh, use, like you mentioned, um, an, an enzyme to cleave that forward uh, read to remove yeah. that. And that will, then the reverse read sequencing will take place. Yeah, sorry about that. That's absolutely right. And then are all, when you do are, is each nucleotide flowed individually or do you put a group of all of them, take a picture, a group of all of them, take a picture? Because presumably you have, a, the clusters give you signal amplification. Right. That's the point of the clusters. Yes. Yeah. So all four nucleotides are added at the same time. 
beautiful. And, they're and so they have a reaction time that they know after this amount of time it's done, next, clear, take your picture and do it again. Yep, exactly. That's a heck of a, that machine. It's insane. Who makes those machines? Yeah. It's so amazing. That precision of something so small. Yeah, it's crazy. And it's not, it's not like insanely um, precise, but how they make up for that is because the clusters have so many thousands of copies. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, it's really it costs cool. so much, says Joel. Well, go back to jail sequencing like I did. <laughs> <laughs> you think doing PCR, I had a PCR reactions a day. Yeah. There were dissertations that were cloning a gene. I know. You could get a whole PhD <laughs> just from cloning a gene. Now you can do it in a, a few hours. <laughs> the PhD oh. is about fortitude. Yeah. Yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah, Illumina, Illumina runs, they they won for sure sequencing by synthesis. 90% of all sequencing in the world done on an Illumina instrument, um, including a gene lab. And yeah, um, these instruments are expensive. So we have a NovaSeq, um, which is the largest sequencer that Illumina offers, and it's a million dollars. That's sequencing. So instrument. you've got to get your sample just right so that it hits a cluster but doesn't saturate into another cluster, I guess. Yes. So that can become an issue. We're going to get into that. Okay. That's where I would see the hang up would be. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get into that for sure. That can be an issue. Uh, okay. Any more questions about sequencing? A bunch of swag. <laughs> Proprietary consumables. Yeah, they do have proprietary consumables. It's all that magic inside that flow cell box. <laughs> FIAX does help with diversity of libraries. Yeah, um, I should mention that. So we do spike in our libraries. So ideally you want a library that's very diverse um, because right, we need to distinguish when we're adding in all four base pairs. And we have, of course, these clusters are like super close to each other, right? So we wanna be able to distinguish the different colors from each cluster. And so if you have a cluster that is, um, or you have multiple clusters that are like similar or the same sequences, and so the calls are gonna be like the same colors that can confuse the, the machine because it should be expecting like different colors and allows it to provide resolution when there's distinction between the wavelengths being admitted. And so you really wanna make sure that you have um, diverse libraries. So you don't want any biases when you're doing your, your chopping, your, your trimming in your library prep. And then also we always spike it with uh, FIX, which is a viral uh, genome um, to enhance diversity uh, just in case. Um, and we don't add any indexes to the FIX, so it doesn't come out when we do our demultiplexing to identify which reads go to which samples. Um, when we do our sequencing, we can set our sequencing parameters. So we set the read length. That's the number of cycles that we've been talking about. And I keep telling you that GeneLab standard is paired in 150. So 150 read length. The longer the reads will increase your gene ID confidence. Why is that? Why do you think longer reads will increase your confidence of knowing what gene that read came from? You can unmute your mic, type it in chat. I was, just, yeah. I, I, I was typing it, but I'm like, there's a more unique sequence length. The more length you have to uniquely say this is the actual region, the easier it is to assemble the long reads together. Short reads is like a shotgun. You only see little pellets of the actual genome or sequenced transcriptome. Right, yeah. So tie in the chat and Joel, yeah, both right. Um, uh, it'll increase the likelihood that your sequence is going to be unique and map to unique location on the genome. Remember, um, genomes, particularly for larger organisms like mammals um, and even small organisms, there's a ton of repeats, right, in your genome. And so if you have really small reads, like let's say less than, than 50 base pairs for mammals, and of course this would depend on the organism that you're using, but let's say less than 50 base pairs for mammals, the shorter it is, you increase the likelihood that it's going to map back to map back to multiple locations on the genome, which will, if your read is mapping back to a bunch of different genes on the genome, then it makes it more difficult to try to figure out where that, where that read came from originally. So the longer you read, the more confident you have that it'll map uniquely and it'll come, you'll know where it came from. 
So and there, there are papers on this that look at different read lengths and what those mapping rates look like for uniquely mapping and stuff. So there's, there's a whole bunch of literature um, on this. And really um, from the literature, we don't get too much more unique alignment when you go beyond 150 base pairs for your, your largest organisms like, like mammals and uh, humans. I shouldn't say your largest organisms because plants are crazy. Um, but yeah, so, so 150 base pairs um, is, is pretty good to have a pretty good unique mapping rate. And so that's the gene lab standard. The other thing is sequencing depth. If you guys remember, your sequencing depth is gonna be dependent on the type of libraries that you made, right? So at the beginning, I kind of talked about two ways for RNA to start preparing your samples to mostly remove that ribosomal contamination is you can either do a positive selection for your message RNA, um, taking advantage of that poly A tail, or you can do a negative selection and remove uh, ribosomal RNA. And so if you guys remember, I talked about if we wanna use these data for differential expression, we're primarily gonna be interested in the message RNA. So if we did a positive um, selection, so selecting for message RNA, do you think that we'll have to sequence deeper or less deep than if we did a ribodeplete? So poly A, do you think we need to sequence deeper, meaning have more sequences than ribodeplete? Or do you think we can get away with fewer sequences than ribodeplete if our ultimate goal is differential gene expression analysis? Any guesses? May Jen says less for ribodeplete. Any other guesses? Let me, um, let me go back to this slide real quick. So if we are interested in differential gene expression, which means we want to know changes in genes that are expressed, which is going to be um, coming from, driving from mRNA, if we do a positive enrichment of poly A or mRNA, we're going to have more of our exonic regions or our regions that um, are going to encode for genes versus if we do ribodeplete, remember, we're just removing ribosomal RNA, so we're leaving all the rest of the RNA in there intact. Joe said we need dramatically more depth without depletion. So we actually need more depth when we do the depletion. And so when you positively select for message RNA, the majority of your sample is going to be made up of exonic uh, RNA or the RNA that's going to encode for a protein. And so you won't have to sequence as deep to get a good idea of the expression of your message RNA. Yeah. Whereas if we do this ribodeplete method, right, now we have our exonic RNA, but we also have quite a bit of intergenic RNA and intronic RNA. And so if we're only interested in differential gene expression, which is looking at the exonic RNA, then we're going to have to sequence a little deeper in our ribodeplete to make sure that we capture the segments that came from those exonic regions. Does that make sense? So, Amanda, uh -huh. if you have a high RIN quality, should you then do poly A and then sequence at a less depth, or is that not the way to approach this? I'm thinking cost <laughs> of everything. Yeah. No, you're, you're spot on. So it ultimately depends on what question you're asking, right? So if the question that you're asking is, what are the changes in gene expression of known annotated genes, then I would go with the route that's going to save you more money and do, and you, and you know, you have high quality RNA because you did your RIN and they're all really high over 9.5. So you have nice intact RNA, which means your poly A tails are, you know, nicely attached to your, your message RNA still. Then I would absolutely go with the cheaper route of doing poly A selection and then being able to sequence at a lower depth to get your differential gene expression. Yeah, that's absolutely right. If you're interested in additional RNAs, um, such as long non-coding RNAs or depending, you might want to use a different kit for microRNAs, so really small 
um, but microRNAs or, you know, peewees or snow RNAs, you name the RNA, any kind of RNA that's non-coding, then you're going to want to go the ribodeplete method because you're going to want to capture those RNAs if you're interested in them. But again, if it's only mRNA that you're interested in, yeah, I do the, and you have high quality, I do the poly A capture and then sequence it at last step. Yeah, we did. I know. You got to like wrap your head around the orientation and what way you're thinking about things. Okay, let's go back to the sequencing parameters. Yeah, so um, uh, sequencing depth. So just have a note here, um, which is probably intuitive now, the greater depth increases the likelihood of also sequencing low abundant transcripts. So that's another thing you want to keep in mind is that if you know that the genes that have differential expression between your two samples aren't really expressed um, that highly, then that's another thing you want to think about when you're deciding on your read depth. So if you're like, oh, I'm really interested in these genes and I know that they're expressed really low, then you're going to want to sequence deeper to increase the chance that, that you capture um, your genes of interest. And um, it can also increase the likelihood of detecting novel transcripts, right? So you have multiple copies of a transcript um, that's currently unannotated. The more copies of you have, the more confident you are that it's there. In order to sequence more copies, you have to sequence at greater depths. And it'll also, the, the greater the depth you're sequencing at, it'll also help you capture and quantify isoforms more confidently. So again, it all depends on the question that you're asking. So this is why, again, I can't I stress this enough when you guys are designing RNA seq experiments, talk to your bioinformaticist before you do your experimental design. Um, greater depth, um, as we just talked about, is going to be necessary for rival depleted samples versus poly A enriched samples, but isn't going to need as much depth because, again, if you're just interested in the message RNA, it's, there's more message RNA represented overall in your poly A enriched samples. Um, so gene lab standard for mammals prepared with vivo depletion is roughly 40 to 60 million reads per sample. Again, we just um, took a look at the literature and looked to see how many different transcripts are represented based on the read depth for um, mammalian model organisms. And it seems like if you go deeper than 60 million reads, you're really not capturing all that many more um, transcripts. And you also increase, of course, your likelihood of sequencing your technical duplicates, right? Um, which is then, you know, technical duplicates, which is um, we want to get rid of anyway. So, um, And that, that brings me to my next point is that usually if you have a certain budget and you're debating between sequencing each sample at an additional 10 million reads, versus adding in another biological replicate, you always want to go with that biological replicate. So the more biological replicates you have, the more confident you're going to be in the differential um, analysis that you're seeing. So just like anything else, increasing your N number is going to increase your confident, um, confidence in your results. And then you can also set up paired end or single end. Um, we do paired end, again, just because you can capture a larger insert when you do paired end. So long as you do your digestion such that your forward and reverse reads aren't a complete overlap of your insert. So we like to do paired end because now we can um, sequence a longer uh, insert, which again, it will give us more confidence when we go back and um, align it to our reference genome. So that's why paired end is preferred. Um, any other questions before we watch one of my favorite videos from Illumina? So this video is Illumina's high throughput sequencing by synthesis. Um, one of their, it's, it's probably older now, um, but it's just, it's such a wonderful video to kind of bring together the whole sequencing um, technique. So I'm going to go ahead and play this. It's a couple minutes long. The Illumina sequencing workflow is composed of four basic steps. Sample prep, cluster generation, sequencing, and data analysis. There are a number of different ways to prepare samples. All preparation methods add adapters to the ends of the DNA fragments. Through reduced cycle amplification, additional motifs are introduced, such as the sequencing binding site, indices, and regions complementary to the flow cell oligos. 
Clustering is a process where each fragment molecule is isothermally amplified. The flow cell is a glass slide with lanes. Each lane is a channel coated with a lawn, composed of two types of oligos. Hybridization is enabled by the first of the two types of oligos on the surface. This oligo is complementary to the adapter region on one of the fragment strands. A polymerase creates a complement of the hybridized fragment. The double-stranded molecule is denatured and the original template is washed away. The strands are clonally amplified through bridge amplification. In this process, the strand folds over and the adapter region hybridizes to the second type of oligo on the flow cell. Polymerases generate the complementary strand, forming a double-stranded bridge. This bridge is denatured, resulting in two single-stranded copies of the molecule that are tethered to the flow cell. The process is then repeated over and over and occurs simultaneously for millions of clusters, resulting in clonal amplification of all the fragments. After bridge amplification, the reverse strands are cleaved and washed off leaving only the forward strands. The three prime ends are blocked to prevent unwanted priming. Sequencing begins with the extension of the first sequencing primer to produce the first read. With each cycle, fluorescently tagged nucleotides compete for addition to the growing chain. Only one is incorporated based on the sequence of the template. After the addition of each nucleotide, the clusters are excited by a light source and a characteristic fluorescent signal is emitted. This proprietary process is called sequencing by synthesis. The number of cycles determines the length of the read. The emission wavelength, along with the signal intensity, determines the base call. For a given cluster, all identical strands are read simultaneously. Hundreds of millions of clusters are sequenced in a massively parallel process. This image represents a small fraction of the flow cell. After the completion of the first read, the read product is washed away. In this step, the index one read primer is introduced and hybridized to the template. The read is generated similar to the first read. After completion of the index read, the read product is washed off and the three prime ends of the template are deprotected. The template now folds over and binds the second oligo on the flow cell. Index 2 is read in the same manner as index 1. Polymerases extend the second flow cell oligo, forming a double-stranded bridge. This double-stranded DNA is then linearized and the three prime ends are blocked. The original forward strand is cleaved off and washed away, leaving only the reverse strand. Read 2 begins with the introduction of the read 2 sequencing primer. As with read one, the sequencing steps are repeated until the desired read length is achieved. The read two product is then washed away. This entire process generates millions of reads, representing all the fragments. Sequences from pooled sample libraries are separated based on the unique indices introduced during the sample preparation. For each sample, reads with similar stretches of base calls are locally clustered. Forward and reverse reads are paired, creating contiguous sequences. These contiguous sequences are aligned back to the reference genome for variant identification. The paired end information is used to resolve ambiguous alignments. Genomic data can be securely transferred, stored, analyzed, and shared in BaseSpace Sequence Hub. Discover the possibilities of next generation sequencing. So um, that video basically summarizes everything I just went over in the previous slides. Um, I love this video. I think it does an awesome job at bringing everything together. It really clarified a lot for me after I watched it about seven times. So you guys all have access to this um, slide deck in that Google Drive. So I highly uh, encourage you guys to view this a couple of times uh, until it, it clicks and, and is making sense. Hopefully you guys are close to that. Um, but now we have our sequences, so it's pretty good. Still a couple of things not sticking, but at least another few is needed. Yeah, yeah, it took me a few a few watches um, to really grasp what's what's going on there. So yeah, definitely recommend watching this uh, a couple of times on your own. 
Um, are there any other questions about anything that we've covered so far from library prep through sequencing by synthesis? Good. Okay. Thanks for such a great job, Amanda. You did a beautiful job of presenting this. Oh, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that. So all that, and we still haven't even started processing our data. <laughs> um, but all that is incredibly important. So when you start to take a look at the data coming off the sequencer and you see things like, oh, when you look at the quality of the data and you see a whole bunch of adapters in there, then you go back to your wet lab and say, hey guys, can I see that electropharogram of your library QC so I can try to explain what I'm seeing on the data processing side. So. Um, and then all sorts of things like that happen. So whenever you notice something um, a little weird or a little off with the sequence data that you're looking at, having a good understanding of the library preparation and how those samples were prepared really helps with troubleshooting and figuring out um, what, what might have gone wrong. So that's why I thought it was really useful to, um, to go through all that. And I actually always, thankfully, um, our managers at Gene Labs are really encouraging of training. And so I actually always piggyback on um, whenever I can to the wet lab when we have trainings. So we've had Illumina come in and go through the entire uh, library preparation protocol with us. And, and I was lucky enough to, to get to join that with our wet lab team. So uh, um, the camera in that system has got to jack up the price point. Yeah, <laughs> photo diode array with a <laughs> fast refresh rate. Yeah, it's crazy how quickly, like this, this happens pretty quickly. Um, it does so that camera that the price has got to be that camera. Oh but yeah. Oh, you're saying like the bulk all of, of that, the you know, it's that camera. Yeah. Yeah. With the, the image resolution for the different. Yeah, for sure. Um, Okay, so now we have sequenced our samples and we're ready to start processing, which is what we're all here to do. So I'm going to go over the first couple steps of processing in the lecture. Um, I'll probably just get to that. Hopefully I'll get, I'll get through that. I might not even fully get through that before we end. So it doesn't look like we're going to get to the hands-on portion today. But um, after I go through the first two steps in the lecture, we're going to do those first two steps hands-on in the Jupyter Notebook. And then this is where we're going to start hopping kind of back and forth. So all day tomorrow, we'll be jumping back and forth from lecture to uh, the hands-on. So this is Gene Lab's RNA-Seq uh, workflow. So as you saw in the Illumina video and in my general overview slide, um, the steps for processing RNA sequence data are um, roughly the same no matter um, where you're processing or who's doing the processing. Um, but the specifics of what tools you use, what options you use in those tools and things like that um, are dependent on who's doing the processing. So at Gene Lab, um, as I mentioned in, my, in our introductory slides, we actually have our analysis working group members, which as you guys now know, is a collection of over uh, 200 scientists worldwide uh, that meet monthly through our analysis working groups. If you guys are not already a member of an analysis working group, I highly recommend you join one or two. Um, and we reach out to them. So, so we'll work amongst ourselves on the data processing team to kind of think about and dive through the literature and um, come up with like maybe a draft pipeline, maybe a draft pipeline or two or three. Um, and then we send that out to our analysis working group members and say, hey, what do you guys think about this pipeline? Do you think that there are other tools that we should have chosen for these different steps? How do you feel about the options that we selected? Is there any options that you think we should change? Because our goal here is to make a workflow that we can use to process RNA-seq data from any organism, right? So if you're doing this in your own research, you might wanna optimize your processing pipeline based on the needs of your organism, the nature of your experiment. But at the project level, we're processing RNA-seq data from a variety of different organisms, from a variety of different experiments and experimental designs. And so we wanted to come up with the best consensus pipeline that we could and so having this community of scientists kind of all weigh in to say, oh, you know, that option might work good with mammals, but for plants, you really should go here. Um, we we're able, after literally years of discussion and debate, um, come up with this pipeline. And so this is how we process all of our RNA-seq data that you see on the GeneLab repository. 
And this pipeline actually evolves. So we revisit because bioinformatics moves really, really fast. Um, so for instance, the first time I did anything with bioinformatics, I was a postdoc and um, the project that I was doing, we actually outsourced all of our stuff, so I didn't really do this myself, um, but I used a set of tools that are now obsolete. Um, and so it's been about four or five years um, since I ended my postdoc and um, already what, what I initially learned uh, to process on is obsolete and even the creators of those tools, it's the top hat um, tools basically said, stop using this for analyzing RNA-seq data. There are better tools out there. So um, yeah, so this changes fast. So we revisit our pipeline annually and then we will update our pipeline um, accordingly. If we have updates to the reference genome, if there's updates to any tools, if there are new or better tools um, to use than what we're using, we'll look and investigate those and then um, make an update each year. So this is our current pipeline. This starts here with our raw reads, right? So coming off of our sequencer, we'll get raw reads in FASTQ files. Actually, depending on the sequencing instrument you use, you'll either get FASTQ files directly or you'll get a level above that called base call images, which are actually pictures um, which you can then use a tool from Illumina called BCL to FASTQ to convert it to FASTQ files. So usually if you outsource your sequencing, whatever the, the core institution is, when they give you back your raw sequence data, they'll give it back to you in FASTQ format, even if the instrument didn't, didn't give it in FASTQ format. So that's what we're going to start our pipeline with, with raw reads in FASTQ format. And I'm going to go over what, what all of these things are. Um, the first thing that we want to do is we want to assess the quality of our sequence data, right? Um, so I should say, I know I keep using the term reads and I don't know if I ever actually defined it. So our sequence coming off the sequencer, um, each set of sequence, so each sequence is considered a read. So in your FASTQ file, which I also keep referring to without defining, your FASTQ file will have all of the reads for a, one sample, essentially. And so unless it could also, you saw the flow cell had separate lanes. So again, depending on what core facility you use, you might get your raw data back and it might have like five FASTQ or four FASTQ files um, for one sample, which you'll then have to use that cat command that we went over in the Unix intro to combine them together. Um, we do all that kind of pre-processing beforehand. Mike actually just got done um, making a nifty little tool to identify um, if a sample has multiple FASTQ files and then concatenate it together so that way we have one set of FASTQ files per sample. So that's what we're going to start with is one set of FASTQ files per sample. Those FASTQ files contain individual reads or sequence information from each of the short sequences that were sequenced when um, you ran it through your Illumina instrument. So the first thing we want to do is assess the quality um, of that sequencing data which we do with a program called FASTQC. And then you could take a look at the data from multiple samples all together at the same time using this nifty program called MultiQC. And it's storming out, so um, sorry if you guys hear that. And uh, MultiQC can actually be used to compile data from a variety of different bioinformatics tools. It's really useful. So you'll notice that up here multiple times. After we assess the quality uh, of our raw reads, we might wanna do some filtering, right? Depending on that quality, depending on what we see, as we mentioned, um, I think I was answering Elba one of your questions, if our interest, sequence of interest, if that they were cut too short, we could potentially sequence into our adapters and then we would have adapters in our raw reads, which of course we don't want. And so um, this trimming filtering step essentially is used to clean up that raw data. And so once we clean up the data, we do another QC check to make sure that anything that we wanted to clean up from the original raw QC uh, data, that we have successfully done that after our trimming and filtering step. Once we have nice, clean sequence data, we're then ready to align it back to our reference genome. However, depending on the tool that you're using to align your reads back to your reference genome, you might have to modify the reference genome to put it in a format so that way the tool can easily find what it's looking for in the reference genome. And so that's the case for the tool we use. We use a tool called STAR. Oh, I should mention to do our trimming, we use a tool called TrimGalore. Under the hood, it's using another tool called CutAdapt. And then we do our QC of our trim data with FastQC, which is the same um, tool that we use to assess the quality of our raw data. And then we again compile that from all samples uh, with MultiQC so we could take a look at the quality of all samples at once. And so then um, using the STAR alignment tool, it needs us to create an index of our reference 
So that way the STAR algorithm know where to find the different parts of the uh, reference genome that it needs. And then it'll align the reads to the reference genome. And then we're gonna assess the quality of that alignment, right? So we wanna take a look to see how well did our reads align? What percentage of our reads align? What percentage of our reads align uniquely to one location on the genome versus to multiple locations on the genome? And so we can compile all of that alignment data with MultiQC as well. Uh, and compile it and compile it from all the samples that we're processing. The next thing that we wanna do, um, so if you guys remember, I had mentioned that our RNA can be derived from either the anti-sense DNA strand or the sense DNA strand. So we can have sense RNA, and that's gonna be your coding RNA, right? But then we can also have anti-sense RNA as well in our original samples, um, and that would be like non-coding RNA. And so we wanna make sure that we know if we used a stranded kit, which strand relative to the reference, or relative to, yeah, relative to the reference that we sequenced. And so we wanna make sure that we know what strand it came from because there are gonna be regions that are conserved in sense and anti-sense um, RNAs. And if that's the case, then we won't know if, if we didn't keep track of the strandedness of our original sample, then we won't know if it was derived, if it came from the sense strand or the anti-sense strand, which you know would encode two different transcripts. So we want to make sure that we know what the strandedness is of our samples relative to the reference that we're aligning to. So we know how to quantitate those transcripts. And so there's a nice program in this RCQC package called Infer Experiment that's gonna take a look at the orientation of our reads relative to the orientation of the reference genome and tell us which strand um, it, it was derived from. This also requires the reference, right? Because it's looking at the orientation of the read relative to the reference. And so it requires the reference to be in a certain format. So we're going to go over um, some of these file formats. It requires it to be in a bed file. And we'll go over what these look like. Um, and so once we have that reference in a bed file, then we can use this tool along with our aligned reads. And it will tell us what the orientation is of our aligned reads relative to the reference. And then we'll um, compile all of that strandedness information, again, using MultiQC. And then once we know the strandedness, now we know how to quantitate it. So we know if everything was derived from the opposite strand of our um, reference, then we want to only quantitate things on the opposite strand. Everything, or if it was derived from the same strand or in the same uh, direction as our reference, then we would want to quantitate everything um, that's in the same direction. And that's a setting that we use in our quantitation tool called RSEM. So RSEM is the tool that we use to quantitate how many reads mapped to each location on the transcript. So we can start to get an idea of the expression of uh, the genes in our samples. And RSEM, similar to the star alignment tool, also requires the index to be, the reference to be in a specific format. And so we have to make an RSEM compatible index from our reference. And then we'll use our sum to do our quantitation. And then we want to assess um, how that quantitation went. And so we, again, use the, the multi-QC tool to take a look at, at that quantitation. From there, we go and we want to, now we will have expression data, right? So we're quantitating the number of reads that map to specific locations on the reference genome. So now we have values for each gene that's annotated in our reference genome for each sample. So we want to put that all together into one um, into one file or one data frame. So that's why Lauren spent so long going over data frames with you guys. Because once we have this expression data, we're going to put it all together into a data frame. So we have every gene, our uh, 20 or 30,000 genes uh, in the mouse, and the expression of each one of them in all of the samples that we're going to analyze. And we have six space flight and six ground control samples, so 12 samples in total. Compile all that into a raw counts table. Uh, and then why, Jen, to your point, um, the next thing that we have to do is normalize that because we're not going to have, for instance, the same number of reads for each sample, right? Um, just by the nature of the Illumina sequencing, you could do your best. You want to make sure, that's why I want to make sure those insert sizes are roughly the same, um, especially from sample to sample. So all of your library size ranges are the same to reduce bias as much as possible when you're sequencing. Because remember, when you put it on the flow cell, it's going to have a bias to latch on to shorter 
to short um, shorter sequences. So normalization by absolute count. Uh, we do normalization by median of ratio. So we're going to go into that in, in a lot of detail. Um, is it, yeah, this is using the estimate size factors uh, function, Susie. Jumping ahead again. Yeah, median of ratios, yes, yes. Median of ratios is what we do through the DESeq2 package, and it's the, uh, <laughs> don't be sorry, <laughs> and it's the, the step of it, it's called estimate size factors. So we're gonna go through that. Um, Lauren's actually gonna, gonna take you guys through that part. Um, and so once we normalize based on read depth, right, to make sure that um, we account for differences in read depth, we're also gonna account for um, differences in RNA complexity, which is something we'll get into, so that way when we do our normalization, we're not like overwhelmed by maybe a contaminant or something that might be in there. Um, so once we do our normalizations on all of our samples, then we're gonna be ready to go and do our comparative analysis, which is differential gene expression. So this is the processing workflow. We're gonna go through all of these steps. We're gonna talk about the theory of it in the lecture, and then we're gonna do the hands-on portion um, through the Jupyter Notebooks. So we got about seven minutes left. I am going to do my best to get through as much of the raw reads portion as I can. Um, FASTQC gives a lot of information and we could really go down some rabbit holes with this. So um, we'll see what kind of questions you guys have as we go through and then might come up more as we actually um, generate these data um, tomorrow. So raw uh, data generated from the sequencer are stored in FASTQ files, as I mentioned where they could also be stored in base calls, which are then converted to uh, FASTQ files. We're going to start with FASTQ files. They contain multiple reads, as I mentioned, and each read has a very specific format. So this is what a read looks like. You'll notice that there's four lines to this read. Line one is going to begin with an at symbol, followed by information about the sequencing run, such as the sequencing platform, the run number, the flow cell ID, the actual cluster location on the flow cell, um, the read number, if it's forward or reverse, and um, the sample index. And so it's kind of actually really frustrating because some databases will actually change the information on that read header line, um, which, is, which is kind of bummer. SRA does that, which is really frustrating. We do not at GeneLab, um, so we keep all this information there. And so you could see this information, again, all this stuff is like, flow cell ID, cluster location, sequencing platform, run number. Um, over, or this is run number, so there's a one here. So this is the first read that's sequenced. So that is one of our reads is sequenced first. You guys remember from the sequencing by synthesis? Which read? Yeah, yeah, Ty, the forward read. So the forward read is sequenced first. Um, so we know that this is a forward read that we're looking at. Um, this then actually tells you that if it can't detect or is unsure of a base call, right? So remember in those clusters, we have multiple copies of the same strand. So if for instance, um, at one position, you have like half of the cluster saying that it's an A and half of the cluster saying that it's a T, that's gonna be um, ambiguous to the, when you take the image. And so it'll just call it an N because it's not sure what it is. So this is telling you what kind of like the default is if it doesn't know what, what base to call. Um, zero, this has to do with uh, control settings of the machine. Um, not entirely, uh, <laughs> can't go into much more detail than that, honestly, about that. Um, this here is the index. Is this single index or dual index? And how do you know? Any guesses? Single index or dual index based on the information in this read header? No guesses? Got both responses, dual, uh, single, I see. Um, so this is actually single, Ty, you're right. Um, so it's single because we have one set of a sequence here. So this is six base pairs long, so this index is six base pairs. And then there's just one of them here. So if there were two of them, if it's coming off an Illumina instrument and if whoever's providing you the FASTQ file hasn't messed with this first line of the read, um, you'll see a plus sign, and then you'll see the sequence for the reverse, the Versa index. So yeah, we know this is single index because there's only one uh, index listed in the read header. Your next line, um, pretty obviously, I hope, contains your sequence of interest, right? Written as base calls. So these are A, T, Cs, and Gs. 
Um, and then I just want you to note that the sequence length uh, is going to be equal to the number of cycles in the sequencing run. So when you have your raw data, if it is indeed raw and no trimming, nothing has been done to it, every single read should be the same length, right? So this is done on the uh, sequencing instrument, which is a computer, and you say, do this many cycles. Um, so every single read should be the same length. So a lot of times, um, more often than, than I thought would happen, uh, I'll come across raw data that was submitted to GeneLab and they'll say that it's raw sequence data. And then I take a look at the FASTQ file and I notice that some of the reads are different sizes. And I'm like, hmm, this is raw data. You either sequenced it multiple times and combined it together. And when you sequenced it multiple times, you used a different read length each time. Or there was some manipulation to this data. There was some trimming that happened. You cut some things off, right? Because if it is true raw data, and if it was sequenced with the same parameters, they should all be exactly the same length. Um, the next line is actually just kind of a separator line. So it almost always has a plus sign here, at least coming off of uh, Illumina instruments. Occasionally, this will just be blank and not have a plus sign, but there will always be an empty line here, whether or not it starts with a plus, but most often than not, you'll see it start with a plus. The ever useless third line plus symbol, yeah. Uh, pretty useless. Don't really know why that line's there except for to take up space. Um, and then line four is going to be your quality scores of each base call. So every time it makes a base call, remember it's making a base call for each of the thousand strands that are there, right? So that's the image that's taken because you have fluorescence based on the base that's there. And based on the purity of that wavelength that's coming off, it'll have a confidence level of what that base is. And so that is represented by a number here, and those numbers are encoded in a thread plus 33 encoded, and they use um, ASCII 2 characters to represent the quality of the bases. So just quickly before we um, sign off, last thing I'm going to go over here is this is what the quality of the bases are. Um, so this is the, the Q score or the quality score. This is the probability or the error rate here, and this is the ASCII 2 number that you see in that fourth line of your sequence. And so um, you'll see a lot of these symbols. If you uh, refer back to the, the previous slide, you'll notice that the highest quality is going to have the highest Q score, right? And the lowest error rate are going to be uh, letters, right? So if you see a bunch of letters um, as opposed to these symbols, you know that your data is really high quality. So just to show you here, we see a whole bunch of letters. Most of these are actually J um, and then J um, what you see here is a quality score of 41 and an error rate of 0. 0.00008. So um, incredibly good. Uh, 40 just above it is a 1 in 10,000 error rate or 99.99% accuracy. So most of those base calls were 99.99% accurate. Um, I'm going to end here and we'll pick up here tomorrow. But before I let you guys go, um, we may not have logged off of our Jupyter Notebooks. My fast it counts, I'm sorry. Um, so if you guys haven't done so already, um, please go ahead and save your R intro notebook that you uh, finished with Lauren this morning. Um, if you haven't done so and you want to export it, file, save an export notebook as, um, export it as an HTML, select where you want to save it locally. Once you've done that, please make sure that you log off. Uh, unless you're planning to go through this again on your own uh, tonight, in which case, go you. Um, but if you're not planning to do this anymore, please make sure you log off because we're paying for it as it's running. So make sure that you log off if you haven't done so already.